I'm Dan Fromer, editor and chief at Recode, and have a great panel here with me this morning. Uh, I'll go from my left, your right, to, no, that's your left. Um, anyway, Ben Leventhal, founder and CEO of Resi, before that co-founder of Eater, which is one of my sister sites at Vox Media. Uh, Suzanne Greenfield, VP of Corp Dev at Priceline. And Dakota Smith, he's the head of growth at Hopper, a mobile first, mobile only flight price tracking tool. Uh, and Chris Stang, CEO of The Infatuation, probably the most successful company in the world, launched off of an Instagram hashtag. <laughs> that was part of it, yeah, that was part of it. Sure. Eat, if you're not familiar with it, check it out. Um, and we're gonna talk about mobile and travel because um, the fact that mobile phones are mobile is what makes them really interesting for travel and um, local research, inspiration, booking, etc. I want to start with um, Suzanne because you uh, you work for the biggest company of all of us, and um, you probably have the highest uh, kind of view of the industry. Uh, and now here we are, ten years after the iPhone launched, uh, the mobile revolution is officially over. Uh, what are people buying? travel-wise on their phones, and what are you seeing uh, kind of from your perspective at Priceline Group? Yeah, absolutely. So just to give people a perspective, uh, Priceline Group is a 90 billion market cap company, and we own a number of different travel assets, Booking.com, Agoda in Southeast Asia, Priceline.com, Kayak, which does a similar type of search meta process to Hopper. Uh, we also recently um, in the last couple of years bought OpenTable, which has a similar service to, to Resi. So we're both in the travel space as well as the kind of hospitality restaurant space. Uh, I would say that travel has definitely, in the last 10 years since the iPhone launch, definitely increased um, as, as most e-commerce bookings on, of travel on the mobile phone has greatly increased. It's still probably less than some other purchases, like if you're ordering an Uber or doing food delivery, which is a much quicker, easier, frequent purchase, travel is a less frequent, more expensive purchase. So we see a lot of people searching on mobile uh, to figure out their trip while they're, but still I'd say only two out of every five bookings that we see for travel are, are done actually on the mobile phone but then a lot more of the discovery and in-destination usage of mobile phones. And then for something like OpenTable, it's greater than 50% of the bookings done on mobile phone because that's a, it's a more uh, frequent and like in the moment experience where you're thinking, oh, I'm in this area, where can I go eat? So, so and, Great. yeah. Um, Chris, I wanna move to you because uh, the infatuation is kind of the, uh, the other, the top end, uh, you might say, of, of someone's funnel. Um, very much in the content and discovery and inspiration sphere. Uh, what works there on mobile? And can you drive commerce through that? Or are you mostly a uh, yeah. media company right now? I mean, look, we think of ourselves as a, as a restaurant discovery platform that's driven by content. So yeah, I mean, we are sort of the top of the funnel, or at least a part of people's, you know, the beginning of their search for where am I going to eat? That's sometimes when they're traveling, obviously in their local cities. but. You know, we do a lot of. We find a lot of success, obviously, with mobile web and our apps. But we also have a messaging platform here in, uh, that operates here in Los Angeles, uh, where people can text us for restaurant recommendations, and we almost use that as like on-demand search. Uh, so people are texting us, asking us questions, just to, as you would if you were asking a friend, you know, about a restaurant in the neighborhood or for a certain situation. And we've actually seen that a, it's a great way to engage the user, and that people are just looking for the least amount of friction possible when they're trying to access whether it's you know, booking something or just finding information before they take that second step. So uh, you know, we do things you know, via button in our app and on our website uh, you know, where we you know, help people book open table or you know, caviar, things like that. And, that. and that works really well. We see great conversion. Uh, but for us, we're really sort of starting to focus on you know, things like inside of messaging and uh, other parts of people's sort of mobile daily life, like where can we help them further down the process you know, beyond discovery. Interesting. I um, want to move to Hopper real quick. Uh, Dakota, you uh, are mobile, you're still mobile only? Yes. So, yeah, so mobile only. Um, it gives you, I think, an interesting tool set. Uh, you're not constrained by some of the parts of the web or the desktop. Um, and what are some of the, the tools that you use at Hopper to drive signups or bookings ultimately that really you can only do on mobile? 
Uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I think that distribution shift to the phone from the web has opened up an opportunity for upstarts like Hopper to, you know, to compete with companies like Priceline. Uh, so you know, by being mobile only, it gives us the luxury of not focusing on conversion in the same session. Uh, so websites always imagine, uh, you know, users who are using a website are always viewing the website, so they're focused on conversion right then, right? Like Booking.com will be booked now, like free cancellation, like change the color, change the placement. Um, and you know, because they're, they're looking at conversion in that three-day to five-day attribution window, uh, by being mobile only and having uh, you know the built-in push notification, you know, re-engagement mechanism, it allows us to take like a much longer lifecycle view of the customer. So on average, our users are coming to us four months in advance of their trip, and on the first session, we're not actually trying to sell them anything. Like we tell most people not to buy their flight to wait for a better price. What we're trying to do is get them to enable push notifications and track a flight. And 80% of users will do that, right? Which is when you compare that to the percentage of users you might get to sign up for an email app campaign on a website, right? That's much, much greater. Um, and then over those four months, we send 42 push notifications to re-engage the user with launch rates that are like 30 to 40% within 24 hours. So that booking comes when the price is right at a much later date. Uh, so that lets us to take our mobile conversion rate, which you know might be low on mobile web or the mobile app of a typical OTA or meta search and make it much greater because you know, it's viewed over four months over the user's trip. And but because you have that ongoing relationship via push notifications, which you know, I guess technically exist on desktop, but really don't kind of work there? Yeah, I mean, I would say like, when you compare the typical way to re-engage a user on the web, um, you know, it is through email, right? So like Google Flights introduced like, a flight tracking email um, sign up button on their, on their Google Flights. Uh, you know, so you might get 10% of users to sign up for that, and you might re-engage them through desktop notifications or through emails, uh, and you might get 20% of users to open that, and then you might get a click-through rate that's 5%. Uh, and what you're left with is, you know, you're you're an order of magnitude less than a push notification where you get 40% of users to see the content you want to see in the app within 24 hours of you pushing it out. And people buy plane tickets that way. People do buy plane tickets that way. We um, we're currently selling close to half a billion dollars of flights per year. Um, so after we launched our app um, two years ago, uh, we've had 20 million users install the app and buy $500 million worth of flights. So it's, um, it's growing. Cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of distribution, it's hard. Uh, the annual Comscore deck hits my inbox. And once again, it's like the average app user downloads zero per month. Uh, it's hard for all of us. It's hard not just for travel apps, but especially for those trying to build a network effect. Um, so you just did something interesting uh, and kind of deepened your partnership with Airbnb at Resi. Tell me, tell me how that works and what that does for you. Uh, well, we essentially worked with Airbnb to extend their platform to include restaurants. So they now have real-time access to all of our restaurants and restaurant inventory. And they can do all of the things through Air, their app that uh, previously were only available through the Resi app. So, that includes obviously making a reservation, canceling a reservation, changing a reservation, but also communicating with the restaurant in real time from their app uh, to, to the software that we provide to the restaurant. So really creating a native uh, restaurant booking experience for Airbnb using our technology service. And is the idea that they, beyond you helping them drive incremental sales or volume through their platform to their customers, is it theoretically also going to bring you a lot of new users or just a few? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in, the, in the long run, we expect it to bring us quite a lot of new users. I mean, I think the primary uh, motivation for us, other than the obvious, which is that we're a small company and obviously get the opportunity to work with somebody like Airbnb accelerates our growth, but, but we look at it as a huge win for our restaurants because they now have the Airbnb uh, base of 70 million travelers who are now going to be uh, who are now going to be booking into restaurants. And so our restaurants, um, you know, get to be in front of those people. Uh, and, and obviously get to be, them, be in front of them on Airbnb and not have to think about how are they going to attract them from the Airbnb network and pull them into their restaurant from somewhere else. Cool. Um, great. Uh, I want to talk about some of the newer things that have come up in kind of mobile over the last couple of years that I think make now an interesting time. Um, one of them is machine learning and AI. I think that uh, if you look at the new iPhone, I think Apple is making a machine learning specific chip now. There's a lot of stuff that's being done on device, obviously in the cloud as well. Uh, I think that 
you know, we'll see how much of an effect this has or doesn't have. Like sometimes this stuff doesn't actually matter. But um, what uh, I'm curious if any of you are doing anything interesting right now that would use those tools to uh, learn more from your customers or um, sell them other stuff that that uh, they weren't planning to buy before or something like that. Uh, yeah, we're doing something that's quite interesting with machine learning that way. Um, so we've introduced last year a contextual recommendation engine in our app. Uh, so we send 40 million push notifications a month uh, recommending users buy or don't buy flights, right? So each notification has a destination, an airline, and a price attached to it. Uh, and then from the way that the users are behaving with like the social graph, you know, we can do a Netflix style uh, recommendation engine to start, right? Which is saying something like, I'm in New York, I'm watching a flight to Hawaii, that flight is $800, but predicted to be $600. What if we send that user a notification saying, what about Bermuda? Because users who watch flights to Hawaii also watch flights to Bermuda, and that flight's $200. Um, so it starts that way, and then through the conversation, which is you know, four months for, per trip, but with our average user making you know, two bookings per year, um, you know, that gives us a, an opportunity to learn about their preferences and their trip preferences. So then we employ like a machine learning algorithm, which is, uh, you know, in spirit, similar to how Facebook would do their newsfeed algorithm, right? Which is if you interact with something, it shows you more of it or learns that about you. Uh, and it kind of builds and increases the social graph. Uh, and then now through these notifications and uh, recommendations, 20% uh, of everything we sell is to a destination the user never asked to see. Um, so that was, that was pretty exciting. Our data science team worked pretty so hard So let's that. unpack that. 20% of your bookings are yes. to places that the person never, never, never asked you that they wanted to fly to. That's, yeah, that's exactly that. right. Um, so you know, users search for a destination or a host of destinations, and 20% of the time they end up buying something they never actually even input into our app. And that, that is a flight. That is not like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, our average. That's not a restaurant order, reservation. Yeah, that's not a restaurant <laughs> our or like a sheet of paper or something. Like is uh, six hundred dollars. Yeah. Like. That's know. amazing. That's crazy. Wow. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, come on, Priceline Group. We're, yeah. we're <laughs> no, I'm so. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We do a lot. We yeah. do a lot. We're doing a tremendous amount with machine learning, AI, natural language processing. Um, with mobile, people are on the go, right? So they're not their desktop anymore. They can't. They can't look at as much information. They can't process information, and they really just want answers very quickly. Um, so we're we're doing a lot with collecting data from mobile and collecting data about our users to personalize offerings to them as well. Uh, we just recently did an acquisition of a company called Evature, which is a machine learning natural language processing chatbot technology, and we're incorporating that into our Booking.com's natural language processing and, and chatbot technology. And we, we've launched this Booking Assistant. And uh, so if people have any kinds of questions about their trip, they can speak with this chatbot that will understand them in multiple different languages and can actually translate in different languages and answer all their questions, the most commonly asked questions about their trip or, or speak to them about those things. So we're trying as much as possible, just like Google is going from being a search engine to an answer engine where you immediately just see your response because no one wants to scroll anymore in the 10 blue links on a mobile phone. We're the same way when people are either searching for travel, booking travel, or after they've booked and they want to learn, they ask questions to the hotel, we're trying as best as possible to give them personalized answers as quickly as possible with machine learning and natural language processing and chatbots. Uh, Chris, you look like you want to say something. No, no, it's, it's just funny because you kind of made the point that I think that it's sort of unclear as to how much this is all going to play in terms of you know affecting all of our different businesses. Right, I think if we were here a year ago, there'd be a lot of talk about bots, and yeah. it seems like that has uh, proven itself to be a lot of talk for, well, most, I think like it for most uses. It so depends far. on what you're using them for. Like, yeah. you know, we'd love to build bots that'll just write all the restaurant reviews for us, but that's not gonna happen, right? So I think the reality is, is like we use some, there's like a sort of a, a proprietary blend that, you know, of people and, and some uh, NLP that makes our messaging platform work, but we also know that in order to like handle sort of complex, you know, human conversation with follow-up questions and nuances of just like trying to understand what a person wants, you know, AI and, and certainly the chatbot interfaces aren't quite there yet. Will they be down the road? 
Sure, potentially. But I think that, you know, like you said a year ago, there was this sort of idea that this was going to be this application that would affect everybody's business and change them immediately and potentially, you know, destroy them all. But I think it's, you know, we'll see where it all goes. But I think there are ways to, you know, obviously, you know, different businesses have different yeah. value propositions with AI and especially as it applies to data. But I think for, you know, when you're part of what we're all doing on some level is curating people's experiences. And I think that, you know, you have to be careful about just thinking you can apply automation to that to solve people's problems. Yeah, I think there's some degree, some questions or things are very commonly asked, and those can be more automated. Yeah. And then there's some questions that are more specific and more have to have more of a human touch. Definitely. Yeah. Um, we're going to open it to audience questions in a couple minutes, so uh, think of something interesting and smart. Um, but uh, I want to ask you, Ben, what, what kind of hasn't, you know, you came into the game as a mobile only, mobile first company, um, strong brand, you know, cool. Uh, what hasn't worked on mobile that you thought it would that kind of pushed you to build out more of a desktop presence than, I don't know if you planned to or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, we, we definitely endeavored to be mobile only when we, when we built our first app. And, I, and you know, as we start to, started to really think about um, how to scale and, and certainly from the early days when we started to engage with restaurants to understand what, what they needed, one thing that was super clear is that there's just still as many reservations and as much engagement as we have on mobile. There's still a huge subset of the uh, of the population that's on desktop, and the, and, and the, the Times alluded to this recently that's still using the telephone. So I think for us, it's just you know to be a full and service. And facts and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there actually are restaurants yeah. using facts. No, I delivery. see it. It's, crazy. it's amazing. Um, we're launching our fax service next week, actually. Um, I kind of want to launch a fax service. I think, and make people buy fun. the fax machine from you because they threw theirs out. It's like the one supplier of the paper. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the I think the point for us on mobile is it's it's one of several platforms that we have to service because we because people are everywhere and and a lot of times they are on mobile, but a lot of times people are sitting at their desk and their and their computers in front of them, and that's it's less frictive for them to book something on on. A, in a, a, a web browser than, than to pick up their phone, and sometimes they want to call. Cool. So, uh, any audience questions? Go for it. So my question is for Dakota. So you guys have obviously had fantastic growth. What's driven that? Um, question was uh, for Dakota. What what is driving your fantastic growth? Are you a hopper? Uh, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> planted <laughs> pet <laughs> pet plant. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. There you go. Fair enough. So it's Canadian like, plant. Um, yeah, I mean, so we launched our app um, two and a half years ago, um, and you know, our decision to be mobile only uh, partly was driven by you know just the focus of our resources. Right, we were a very small team at the time. I think we had twenty persons working here. Um, you know, so less than ten engineers. Um, and in our first year, you know, we had a million new users install the app, um, and at the time, we were pretty excited. I mean, we didn't really know what to expect. Uh, but then last year, like our growth kind of uh, kicked into high gear, and we had you know over 10 million users install the app, um, and then you know the sales followed as well, right? So I think part of that being mobile only and trying to get users who are four to five months away from making a booking event, uh, that's very different than the type of users that companies like Priceline or Expedia are trying to acquire, right? So they're the channels where they are acquiring users are like Google Search, right? And they're paying a lot of money for a user who is very low in the funnel and very high intent who's ready to make a booking today. Uh, we're, we're acquiring users very much in a different way, right? We're acquiring users on places like Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, users who are not ready to make a purchase and won't be ready to make a purchase for months. Um, and those users are obviously a lot more affordable. Uh, so, you know, collectively, Priceline, Expedia, and TripAdvisor spend $10 billion a year on digital marketing. Um, that's a lot more than us. That's, you know, over a thousand times more than we spend. Uh, but every month in North America, we get more installs than either of their apps. Uh, and that's only possible because of that distribution shift. I, mean, I don't have a mic to drop. You don't either. Um, all right, we have time for counterpoint. Counterpoint. They make a lot more money than us. We make a lot. We make a lot more money, and we have a lot more travel bookings. So I would. I yeah, of course. We have a lot of app <laughs> installs, and so we're so. <laughs> There's no, mic, there's no mic anywhere, drop. People. We have uh, one more. Anyone uh, back there? Uh, hey, uh, really for Chris, love extra X. Want to hear a little bit more about like how you decide what to do where, like what the, uh, 
what you do where. So what you decide to do in your messaging platform versus what goes in app and what goes on mobile web. Yeah. Well, I, can't, I mean, Ben, you were sort of touching on this too. It's like I, the way we think about all of this is that, you know, obviously mobile is where everything is moving and it's very important to be, you know, focused there. But so many of our users are also sitting at their desk and they're planning a, you know, a meal or trying to you know, connect with friends and decide what to do. And they're doing it, that might be the, the thing they're doing for a couple of days out or that evening. Obviously our apps are more sort of focused on where am I right now uh, or they're in the restaurant looking for what to order. The texting platform is interesting just because for us we just found that um, it's a much more engaged, like it's, an, it's a user that wants to be very, very engaged with the brand and it's honestly somebody that like surprisingly tends to know exactly what they want, but they kind of want like someone to feed them other options, right? So the kind of people that are very, at least from our experience so far, running it for a couple of years, in New York, mostly in New York, you know, it's an audience that's extremely engaged with our brand. They tend to know mostly how we feel about places, but what they're looking for is like further information from what they can find in the app or, you know, on the desktop. So, you know, we, we sort of think about ourselves as having five different products from, you know, the web, our apps, our social reach, which is often you know used as a discovery platform as well, uh, and then the messaging platform, and uh, and they all operate differently. And so we try to really just think about like what does the user want from this specific product. And ideally, you know, all of our users use some combination of all five of them. But you know, it doesn't really matter to us what combination. Like we, if if we can get you using every single product that we offer, great. But for us, we just try to think about you know how are we serving the user and with what tool, and then how do we make that tool better? Uh, you know, in terms of helping people discover. So, great. We are out of time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.